Welcome to Economics 1723 Capital Markets. This is the online module for Lecture 15. We're going to talk about forward rates and the expectations hypothesis of the term structure. So to begin, forward rates. Uh, what is a forward rate? It is a guaranteed interest rate on a bond investment to be made in the future. So we're going to set the rate today, but we're not going to pay any cash until later. So uh, that could be done through some type of financial contract, but it can also be done by trading bonds of different maturities today. Provided you can go long and short, you can essentially um, um, set up a, a trade that has no cash, uh, no cash outflow or inflow today, but uh, effectively guarantees an interest rate on a fixed income investment to be made in the future. And the rate on that investment is called a forward rate. So. To be more specific, the M period ahead one period forward rate is the rate guaranteed at time T for a one period investment to be made at time T plus M, which will pay off one period later at time T plus M plus one. So how can you do this? How can you combine bonds to get this guaranteed rate? Well, here's a, a, a time diagram. Uh, please uh, forgive the typo here. These capital T's should be little t's. So we're standing at Time little t, we're looking forward m periods and m plus 1 period. Now, imagine first buying a single m plus 1 period bond. That'll give you $1 at time t plus m plus 1. But it'll have a cash outflow today because you'll have to spend, hence the negative sign to indicate an outflow or spending, you're going to have to spend p m plus 1 t on the bond today. So what we'd like to do is offset this with some money to be received today that cancels it out, giving us zero down here on net, but it may involve paying out uh, and thus uh, having a cost at this future time, T plus M. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to sell M period bonds. We'll get some cash today and we'll have to pay something in the future. Uh, how many of these bonds do we need to sell? Well, the cash we want to raise at time zero is P M plus one T. Each bond that we sell is going to bring in P M T today. So the number of bonds we have to sell is P M plus one T divided by P M T. Multiply it through and you can see that the cash flow here is just going to be P M plus one T, which will cancel out this and we'll have zero on net. Of course, the cost of doing this is that when time T plus M arrives, we're going to have a cash outflow of P M plus one T divided by P M T because we're going to have to pay the face value on that many bonds. And so that is the cost of the investment. You can see that on net, we've locked in a rate today using today's bond prices, but essentially we're going to be buying a, a discount, a one period discount bond at time T plus M for this price. And then one period later, it'll pay off. So what is the forward rate? The gross forward rate is then the rate of return on a gross rate of return on that investment, which is one divided by the price you pay, which as we just showed on the previous slide is this ratio. Now, if I uh, substitute in for yields, get rid of prices and replace them with yields, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just use the fact that, uh, you know, PMT is, 1 over 1 plus ymt to the m, and pm plus 1t is 1 over 1 plus ym plus 1t to the m plus 1. So I'm going to get this ratio of gross yields. The forward rate is a ratio of gross yields. Now, as so often is the case, uh, this formula is much easier to use and think about if we take logs. And then the, uh, we'll define little fmt as the log of this gross forward rate. And that's just the the difference between the log price PMT and the log price PM plus 1T. So going back one slide, instead of all these ratios and then powers of things, we're going to get just changes in logs. So we have the difference between two successive log bond prices at a point in time, but with two successive maturities. If we substitute in now for yields, we're going to get M plus 1 times YM plus 1T minus M times YMT. And I can rearrange that to say that the forward rate is the yield plus a multiple M plus one of the difference in the yield of maturity M and M plus one. So you can think of it as, as the 
time period shrinks, you can think of this as the slope of the yield curve. So the, the, the level of the forward curve is the level of the yield curve plus a multiple of the slope of the yield curve. This tells you that forward rates will be above current yields whenever yields are rising and below current yields whenever yields are falling as we move along the yield curve. When I'm talking about rising and falling, I'm talking about changes in maturity at a point in time. I'm talking about the slope of the yield curve. Okay, so that's forward rates. Now let's go on and talk about the expectations hypothesis of the term structure. So recall from lecture, we discussed the Orange County case and the Orange County treasurer, Bob Citron, had the strategy of buying longer term bonds whenever the yield curve is steep. Now, of course, while longer term bonds may have higher yields in that situation, that doesn't mean that they have higher returns over any fixed holding period. So the expectations hypothesis is the claim that bonds of all maturities have the same expected returns, even if they have different yields. The pure expectations hypothesis, or PEH, says that the returns are exactly the same, and the expectations hypothesis without the word pure, we'll write that EH, says that the uh, returns on these different bonds differ only by a constant that remains the same over time. So um, what's the bottom line? If these hypotheses hold, then Citron's strategy of going long when the yield curve is steep is pointless because the, the, the returns are either exactly the same or differ only by a constant in expectation on average. Now I'm going to take you through several views of this pure expectations hypothesis or several implications of it. We'll do the short term view, the long term view, and then at the end we'll do a third view which is called the forward rate view. Okay, so what are the short term and the long term views? Well, if the yield curve is steep, you know you can earn a higher annualized return holding a 30 year bond for 30 years than holding a one year bond for one year. But that, of course, is a meaningless comparison because the holding period is different. It's possible that holding a 30 year bond and selling it after one year gives you the same return as holding a one year bond for one year. That's the short term view. It's also possible that rolling over one year bonds for 30 years gives you the same return as holding a single 30 year bond for its lifetime, its 30 year lifetime. That's the long term view. So let's work through each of those in turn. Well, how is it possible that a long term bond can have the same expected return over one period as a short term bond with a lower yield? It's easiest to think this through in logs and I'm going to do first an example and then show you the general case. So here's an example. Suppose an investor faces a 4% log yield on a one year bond and a 7% log yield on a 30 year bond. That's much higher. Well, the log holding period return for the one year bond over one year is 4%. What's the log holding period return for the 30 year bond? That's going to be the 30 year yield or 7% minus 29, that's maturity minus one times the change in the yield on the bond while you hold it, which is the 29 period yield next year minus the 30 year yield today. Now, in order to make this whole thing equal to a 4%, this term, which gets multiplied by 29, is going to have to be um, about 0.1% because, uh, you know, if this, if this were 30, then 30 times 0.1% is 3%, 7 minus 3 is 4. So roughly speaking, 0.1%. So that says that the PEH holds if the yield on the 30 year bond is expected to rise from 7% to just only 7.1% over the next year. A little tiny increase in yield over the next year is enough to cancel out that initial yield difference, giving you a capital loss on the 30 year bond that's just enough to offset the higher initial yield. Now, let's do this more generally. The PEH says that one period log holding returns are equal in expectation. It says that the one year interest rate or log yield equals the expected log return on an M period bond held for one period, which is the initial yield minus the multiple M minus one times the expected change in that yield while you're holding the bond. We can rearrange this to say that the yield spread between the long and the short bond has to be the multiple M minus one of the expected change in this uh, long term interest rate. So the short term view is that the yield spread forecasts short run changes in the yield of long term bonds. 
we can show this graphically like this. Here's a situation where the 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 I'm showing again uh, time here on the horizontal axis. We're, we're looking at one year ahead and m years ahead. Here's the price, the log price of the one year bond. The yield is the slope of this line. Now here's the log price of the M period bond and the yield is the slope of this line, which is higher. You can see this line is steeper than this one. But it's possible that uh, the over the next year, the two bonds are going to have the same return if the price of the long bond is expected to move like this. In other words, parallel to this line. And then subsequently, it'll have to go up more steeply. Now, there's one puzzling aspect of this short term view. We've said that a high yield spread must predict an increase in the yield on the long bond, which is just enough to give you a capital loss that offsets that bond's higher yield. But this seems counterintuitive. When the long bond yield is already high, it has to be expected to rise even further. So you might think this would mean that the yield spread just keeps getting bigger and bigger because the high long term yield is rising. Well, to resolve that puzzle and get escape this paradox, let's also consider the long term view. So let's uh, go back to the above example where we have a 4% log yield on a one year bond and a 7% log yield on a 30 year bond. And this time let's focus on 30 year returns. The log 30 year holding period return for the 30 year bond is 7% annualized. What is it for one year bonds? Well, we're going to take 4%, which is the first year, plus 29 times the average of expected short rates over years 1 th through 29 ahead, and, and then divide by 30 to annualize. So the PEH is going to hold if future short rates are expected to be 7% times 30 minus 4% divided by 29, which is about 7.1% on average. All right, so going back here, if, if we plug in 7.1%, roughly in here, then this whole thing is going to calculate out to be uh, about 7% and that'll equate the, the 30 year returns on the two strategies. Now that average future short rate of 7% is 7.1% uh, is actually higher than the current long rate of 7% and much higher than the current short rate of 4%. But that's the expected increase in future short rates that is needed to ensure that both strategies are equally attractive. Now, doing this more generally, the PEH says that the long yield YMT equals the, the average of the current and all expected future short rates that take you over the next M periods, dividing by M to annualize them. We can rearrange this to show that the yield spread has to equal an average of expected uh, differences between future short rates and the current rate. So in other words, according to the long term view, the yield spread forecast long run changes in yields on short term bonds. So here's the diagram for this case. Uh, here's the um, uh, at the bottom here, we have the expected return over 30 years on the long bond, the M period bond. That's the slope of this line. Up here we have um, the expected return on the 30 year uh, investment strategy. Now, initially that has a lower rate, but then if short rates are expected to be higher in the future, when we follow these lines along to the to 30 years out, the expected return on rolling over the one year bonds is on average over the 30 years, the slope of this dashed line, which I have made parallel to the slope of this line, indicating that both have the same expected return. All right, so summarizing these two views, according to the PEH, a high yield spread predicts a small near term increase in the long bond yield from 7% to 7.1% in the example, and a larger longer term increase in the short yield from 4% to an average of 7.1% in the example. So in this way, the yield spread will come back to normal, which resolves the earlier puzzle. Even though the long bond yield is going up slightly, the short term yield is going up more and that's going to bring the, sh the yield spread back to normal. Uh, now I've talked about the pure expectations hypothesis, but the more general version of the expectations hypothesis is just the same, except that it allows for a constant risk premium on long term bonds. It gives predictions that are similar to the PEH. 
So let's think about an example. The 30-year bond might have an average return, which is 3% higher than that of the 1% one-year bond. In that case, a yield spread of 3% does not require any expected changes in interest rates. But an unusually high yield spread that's higher than 3% does generate the same predictions we were talking about before. So basically, in empirical tests, the distinction between the PEH and the EH is not that important. Essentially, the PEH has an intercept of zero, and the EH has a free intercept, but the implications for the dynamics of interest rates are the same. Now finally, at the very end here, I want to talk about a third view of the PEH, which looks at forward rates. That brings us back to the beginning of this module. A third equivalent way to state the PEH is that it says that forward rates equal expected future spot rates. So here's the forward rate. This is the definition of the forward rate that we had before, and that is going to equal the expected short rate uh, m periods out, m periods ahead. So the interpretation then is that under the PEH, forward rates capture the market's prediction of future short rates. Now this, this prediction essentially follows by applying the long-term view that we just did. I'm going to show it in an example and then derive the general formula. So let's think about the example. The 30-year bond has a log yield 7%, the one-year bond has a yield 4%. Now suppose at the same time that the 29-year bond has a log yield of 6.9%. Then the log forward rate, F29, can be calculated as 30 times 7% minus 29 times 6.9%, that's 9.9%. Now, if we apply the long-term view twice, for years 0 to 30 and for years 0 to 29, the forward rate must also satisfy that it's going to be um, the sum of expected short yields between years 0 to 30, that's this thing, uh, minus the sum of expected short yields between years 0 to 29, which is this thing, and when we take the difference between these two, the only difference is the expected short yield in year 29. So that's how we, we derive this implication. So in the example then, the expected short rate in year 29 must be 9.9% very high if indeed the 29-year bond has this log yield. Okay, so, uh, you know, more generally, um, we can just write down this equation. The forward rate is m plus 1 times ym plus 1t minus m times ymt. Just plug in the long-term view. We're going to get a sum of expected short rates minus another sum of expected short rates. And everything cancels out here except for this term, the expected short rate uh, uh, m periods ahead. And that's what proves the forward view of the expectations hypothesis of the term structure. Thank you. <laughs>